Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Dan Mogulov from the Campus Office of Communications and Public Affairs, and I am truly delighted and honored to welcome um, a guest who really needs no introduction, Chancellor Carol Chris, to this, the final version of Campus Conversations uh, for this semester. So let's just welcome the Chancellor. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to read a very brief bio, even though she needs no introduction, she's going to get one anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, Carol's going to sort of set the table with some brief opening comments, and then we're going, to, we're going to take your questions and get into the conversation part of this event. So um, Chancellor Chris began her term as the 11th Chancellor of the University of California on July 1st, 2017. And I just want to note and I've seen this with numerous reporters, if you want to get off on the wrong foot with Chancellor Christ as a reporter, just ask her what it's like to be the first woman chancellor. <laughs> so if any of you have written that on a card, toss that immediately. Just, just some informal advice. Um, she is a celebrated scholar of Victorian literature and known as an advocate for quality accessible at public higher education. Um, Carol spent more than three decades as a professor and a senior administrator here on campus, both as executive vice chancellor and provost between 1994 and 2000. Um, she was president of Smith College, one of the country's most distinguished liberal arts colleges from 2002 to 2013. She returned here in January 2015 to direct the campus's Center for Studies in Higher Education and was appointed interim executive vice chancellor and provost in April 2016 before being named chancellor last March, March 2017. Without further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you, Janet. Thank you. You know, it would be so much more natural for me to be walking around, but I realize there's a stationary camera, so there has to be a stationary <laughs> chancellor. Um, I, I, I want to say, first of all, that the reason that I so much dislike this question about what is it like to be the first woman chancellor, not a single person, I can guarantee you, said to Clark Kerr, what's it like to be the first male chancellor? <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, what I want to do I, is first thank you. I see lots of familiar faces in this room and some faces that I don't know. Uh, most of you are staff, not all of you are. But I just, um, I, we have such a fabulous staff at Berkeley, and I just want to thank you for the good work that you do every day, the imagination you bring to your work, the loyalty you bring to the campus, so thank you. I'm going to do two things in my opening remarks. The first is to remind you what my goals are, the goals that I determined um, uh, when I began that chancellorship. And then I'm going to talk about the strategic planning process in relationship to those goals. So first, my goals. There were five of them. There are five of them. First, to build community. Second, to enhance the student experience so every student thrives at Berkeley, doesn't just survive at Berkeley. The third is to increase diversity among students, both graduate and undergraduate, staff and faculty. The fourth is to invest in those research initiatives where Berkeley can make the biggest difference to our state, our nation, and our world. And the fifth is to create a new financial model for the campus. As you, I think most of you know, we've been engaged in a strategic planning process since the fall. Um, we haven't had a strategic plan since 2002, so it's certainly timely to create a new one. And I decided to structure this um, strategic planning process around four strategic questions that I think are really important for the campus to answer. Um, before I say what the four questions are, I want to say that it's very easy, and it's certainly, I've done this a lot in this 150th year anniversary, to have a triumphalist narrative of Berkeley you know, oh, all the great things we've done. I think it's much more important to have a resilience narrative about Berkeley because, in fact, there have been lots of challenges in the course of our 150-year-old uh, history. And one of the things that distinguishes the campus is how imaginative, how inventive, how resilient the campus has been in regard to those challenges, whether they're the loyalty oath controversy, budget problems, repeatedly the uh, free speech movement. And so I think it's important, I, I, I think triumphalist narratives get you into trouble 
because there, there's no place to go but down. <laughs> but um, but I so I've been trying to build a resilience narrative for the campus, and. I, I, Bill, Berkeley, as is, is Henry Brady was saying the other day in a talk that he gave to the regents, um, Berkeley is a kind of miracle. The University of California is a kind of miracle. And it's important to think about what that miracle is, but also important not to shy away from the questions that I believe we have to answer if we're going to have a future that has been as brilliant as our past. And the questions are these, the four questions. What are the, um, the, the I, I was using the word grand challenges. Some faculty feel that's too corporate, but I'm going to use that word anyway. What are the grand challenges that the, the campus can collectively address that are going to have the most impact on the uh, state, the country, and the world? The big, big research questions where you need multiple disciplines to come up with solutions. Second, are what investments can we make that will have the greatest impact on the quality of student experience? The third is um, uh, what our um, uh, enrollment strategy is for the future. It's not any secret that Berkeley's been growing. Our enrollment um, uh, uh, targets are not entirely within our control, but I think the campus would be well served if at least it had its own viewpoint about what we thought, how big we thought we should be. And then finally, what is the new financial model for the campus? And so you can see from my just saying what those questions are, very much connected to my priorities. Tomorrow morning, in your email box, your inbox, you will have the steering committee's first draft report of the strategic plan. And so I wanted to do, just by way of kind of stimulating the discussion, tell you what the main recommendations are, and then we can talk about them more if you like. The first is um, define and leverage Berkeley's distinctive character and comprehensive uh, academic excellence. It is really calling on Berkeley to articulate, celebrate, and reinforce the values and qualities that have made it great and to continue to serve as an exceptional international model. Now, I, you know, I'm a student of English. That's my academic field. And I am a really a big believer in narratives and how important narratives are. And I think Berkeley has to spend a lot of time thinking about what its story is at this moment in its history. Not it's, oh, we're so great that we're the greatest university in the world, but what's the story of the next 10 years? What's the story we want to tell about ourselves? And I believe in the power of mission statements, so I've been challenging this steering committee to think about a mission statement. I've been very moved by the mission statement or the principles that the Haas School developed. Question everything. Um, students, always. Confidence without attitude and beyond yourself. That says a lot if you think about each of those things. And they're pretty close to what Berkeley is, too. So the first recommendation is really a kind of, 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 of recommendation about narrative and about mission. The second, curricula for the future, create new flexible academic programs that foster multidisciplinarity and draw on Berkeley's comprehensive excellence. Um, the world is so different now than it was certainly in the 90s when I was in the administration before. And I think most people are aware that you need more than one string to your bow to be successful in the world of today. That you need more than um, a, a, a one discipline that you do, but really kind of multiple capacities and competencies so the steering committee that is really interested in the idea of combining two majors, they're calling them half majors. I'm not sure that's the best term, but that's what they're calling them. And three plus two plus four plus, and four plus one programs. So students in five years leave not just with a bachelor's, but with a bachelor's and a master's. Um, they recommend expanding high quality online summer off-campus programs that create flexibility for students and explore 
non-traditional kinds of enrollments um, online, certificate programs, degree completion programs, post back programs. We want to, but our admit rate this year was only 13%. That's a real problem for Berkeley. And we need to reach out and touch more people. And we can do it through different kinds of programs. Third, create a community where all Berkeley students can thrive, both academically and personally. For me, the big issue here is housing. I've said often I want to double the housing capacity of Berkeley in the next 10 years. Um, I'm happy to talk about how I want to do that if you're interested in talking about that later. We are in something of a crisis in terms of financial support for graduate students. We're no longer as competitive as we once were in our financial packages. So um, uh, more financing for particularly doctoral students is really important. Our facilities need work, as you all know. Um, I think enough said there. And I think we have to improve our both advising and mentoring of students, uh, both undergraduate and graduate. Fourth is grand challenges, um, which I think they are now talk uh, they've decided to use the word signature initiatives. Develop targeted approaches, including reach, re research, teaching, and public service for Berkeley to address a set of very carefully determined issues. And the ones they're thinking about now are inclusive intelligence, that means both human and artificial intelligence and the way they interact, environmental change, sustainability and justice, democracy governance and freedom of expression, inequality and opportunity, charting a new course to health and well-being, and being the public university of the future. The fifth is um, a uh, recommendation about diversity, which I believe in very strongly to increase our diversity. And they um, put forward the very audacious goal of becoming in 10 years a Hispanic serving institution. That would mean 25% um, of our undergraduate students are Hispanic. Um, Expanding access, the, this, the steering committee, this will probably be the most controversial thing they're recommending, is recommending that we continue to grow um, if, if we can get the adequate resources. Um, so that's going to be a complicated one to think about, I think. Seventh, um, a move toward a more holistic and disciplined approach to making financial decisions. Um, we, we're really stuck in a set of financial practices that relate to an old financial world in which we had lots of different colored money, most of them from the state, and those monies were mapped to their uses. We have to change our whole philosophy of budgeting. See, money is money. All money is green, rather than saying, oh, well, this money came from this, so it has to be used for that. We're not going to be using our resources wisely until we um, um, develop a culture and a financial system of integrated and holistic budgeting. And then finally, a trust-based ethos, increasing transparency, reducing complexity, and building revenues um, with met by methods that are consistent with our values. So I'll stop there. There's lots of room for conversation in those um, Thanks. We're going to get to some more questions about the strategic planning process. But I, I just, I'm going to use my moderator's prerogative to ask you a couple of questions I really have been meaning to ask you for a while, actually. So I think it's safe to say that few chancellors have come into office here knowing the campus as well as you did. What surprised you? What challenges that you faced were surprising, or what pleasantly or unpleasantly now that you've, you know, you've been in that corner office? Well, I think it's so important to not assume that the university you knew, in my case, in the 90s, is the university now. There are a lot of important changes to the campus. Certainly, the way the free speech controversies have played out, very different, very new dynamics. The world of research is, research funding, I should say, is profoundly different than it was in the 90s. It used to be in the 90s that the public dollar was the most valuable dollar. The federal research, you know, whether it's from you know, NIH or NSF or NASA, that was the most valuable money. 
now it's much more, there's a very complicated, high stakes world of private philanthropy and research. And often for, for many of our researchers, I've heard them say, those are the most valuable dollars, the freest dollars for us to use, the dollars that allow us to take greatest risk. So the world of research is different. The world of entrepreneurship is so different. It used to be, I remember having a meeting in the 90s in which we brought a bunch of venture capitalists into a room somewhat like this them, and asked them, how do we create a better relationship between the campus and venture capital? And everybody was looking really puzzled and scratching their head. And now, as you know, there's grown up on the borders of the campus, incubators, accelerators. This world is so robust and has so many moving pieces to it. That's really different. So I, I think it's so easy for Berkeley, because it's been so great for so long, to develop what I, uh, one of the deans called a legacy problem, just thinking, it was great in the past, and so nothing has to change. We just have to go back to our glory days, and the things, things change. But you asked me what surprised me about this job. The thing that surprised me most is how much time I've had to spend on athletics. I didn't expect that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> yeah, amen. Um, and what's, the, and what's the hardest part? And what's the best part of being chancellor? Oh, the best part is, you know, when you're in these positions, I felt this when I was president of Smith, you meet people you never would meet if you were a faculty member. And it's just the variety of people that you meet, alumni, staff, um, students, and so just understanding them and getting this sense that you feel I mean, certainly very powerfully for me that this is Berkeley. Berkeley is its human communities that extend in space and through time. So that's the best part. What's the worst part? Hardest, this is hard. The hardest part. <laughs> I, I think there are two really hard parts to my job. Um, one is making progress on diversity. Um, that it's these, they're, I've come to so much appreciate how hard life is on this student for on this campus for undocumented students, how hard life is for our African American students. Three um, percent. I when I came to the campus in 1970, three percent of the faculty were women. I know what it feels like to be three percent. It means in a room like this, maybe there are five people who you, are like you. And so um, I, I've been aware of how many of our students struggle with just basic needs. Um, homeless, by which I don't mean they're pushing shopping carts around the campus, but that they're couch surfing, they're living in their cars, they're sneaking into campus buildings to sleep at night, and, and a lot of them just don't frankly get enough food. So I guess I, I, those weren't really the same issue, but that's one issue is the is the, the, the real intractability, not just on campus, but in our country of diversity issues. The other is that the financial challenges that the university is facing and the way in which the culture has to change to create a different financial model is genuinely hard. I don't think hard is bad. I like challenges, I like hard problems, but you can't ever pretend they're not hard. Carol, you also mentioned free speech, and just, you know, here we are in May, in September, you said you want to dedicate this year to campus to an engagement, to a conversation about free speech. A lot's happened. We spent an incredible amount of money to provide security through yesterday, where Milo Yiannopoulos is being chased out of a bar in New York, <laughs> being heckled, and I think we can take some credit for that. Um, and. But by the same token, and as people may not even know it, in the last few months, we've had a number of high-profile conservative speakers who've come through campus, not a ripple in the pond, no fuss, no muss. So where do you think we are? What do you think we've learned, and what have you learned in the course of this academic year engaging with those issues? Well, I've learned, first of all, that free speech is not just a set of principles you put on a piece of paper. It's very much a process of engagement. 
and that you, 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 uh, the constitutional protections for free speech, in which I ardently believe I'm not someone, as some people in the community argue we should change the protections of, uh, in the First Amendment, I believe that those are extraordinarily important protections even when we hate the speech that we're hearing. But they will therefore often come in conflict with some of the values we hold as a community. And that's a process of engagement. And I hope we've made some progress in making people's or allowing um, everyone on campus to understand how complex these issues are and to engage with them more thoughtfully and deliberately. We're about to release the report of the Commission on Free Speech. I think it's a really, really excellent report, makes some very good recommendations, I think, of ways in which we can better align um, the protections we afford to free speech with our values as a community. Uh, and, but that's what's, you know, I suppose this is true of any really important issue that affects a community. It takes a lot of talk and a lot of work to start to change how people see things. I also think we were successful in changing the narrative. I, I think, I, I know that many people, including me, are um, really hate that we spent so much money. Um, but on the other hand, the fact that we had such a calm spring, I think, um, uh, is related to the fact that spending the money enabled us to change the narrative. Thank you. Um, so we're going to go now and do some questions in the audience. And I just want to re remind folks that as we go along, if, if you questions pop into your minds and you want, uh, would like to submit them, fill out the card, hold up your hand, somebody will come gather them. So um, it's actually this first question. It's, it's the third time I've heard this uh, this week, for whatever the reason. I love that I've seen you on BART. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh. Um, getting to and from someone like a, quote, regular person. <laughs> and so this, uh, this person wants to know, what do you do, a practice or something, and I assume they mean something like yoga or meditation, to stay grounded? Oh, gosh. Well, um, I uh, have living with me this year my um, son and my daughter-in-law and my two grandchildren who are six and two. And that keeps you grounded. <laughs> My granddaughter, my six-year-old granddaughter, um, doesn't quite understand my job. She thinks I'm the principal of this school. <laughs> and I say, yeah, that's pretty right. <laughs> and she says, you arrange everybody's schedules, don't you, Grandma? <laughs> well, she's right. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. That explains. I mean, I, more seriously, I, I play. I try to play music more than I get the time to do. That really keeps me grounded. You, when you play music, you're always in that music space. And what do that, you play? I play the viola and the piano. Uh huh. And so that's not at the really, same time. I hope. No. No. <laughs> no. I haven't mastered that yet. <laughs> uh, so the next one, going to a slightly different area, is what, in your opinion, gets our major donors excited? How do their interests mesh? or not with our own? And then maybe you could expand on that a little bit, talk about your, your vision for philanthropy and the role it's going to need to play in the campus's yeah. future. Yeah, what donors want? I mean, donors um, are, they want to love us. And they, they, what they want is a vision. What they don't want is a shopping list. They don't want a sense of how terrible the state is to us, so of course you have to give us lots of money. They don't want a tale of woe. Um, that donors with the capacity to invest um, philanthropically in a transformational way want to invest in a vision that they feel their gift is going to help you achieve. They love our faculty, they love our students. And so in part why we're doing this strategic planning process is that we need that vision in order to motivate philanthropy at the highest level. In terms of philanthropy, we have to learn how to do things somewhat differently as a campus. And I would say there are two principal ways in which we have to learn to do things differently. Um, the first is 
that, well, we're, we're kind of Johnny come lately to the philanthropy game. Our first comprehensive campaign for the campus was in the late 1980s. Um, so that's way behind places like Harvard and Stanford and Yale and Princeton. And for a long time, because we, got, we were so generously funded by the state, philanthropies were nice to have extras. Now what we have to do is raise money for the core. It has to become an important revenue stream for the very center of what we do. And second way in which we have to change, philanthropy is very decentralized at Berkeley. So I've had so many donors tell me, when I walk on campus, I feel like I have a target on my back. Um, or I feel that I can't have a conversation with an individual that I might happen to know without being hit up for money for their special project. And for donors with um, large capacity, you have to deal with them in a holistic way. And, and being nickeled and dimed to death, or another donor used the word bitten to death by mosquitoes, it's just, I mean, it's just not the most effective way to um, be um, inspiring the greatest philanthropic gifts. So this is going to demand much, much more collaboration between our units. And you can't see a donor as an ATM or go to a donor with a kind of shopping list as you would go to the supermarket. You really have to, when, a, when a, uh, um, someone with great capacity, financial capacity, gives a gift, it's a statement about who they want to be on this earth and who they want to be, what they want their legacy to be. And you have to tap into that imagination that that's really important. So you mentioned collaboration just now. And in fact, two questions have come in from the audience that touch on exactly that issue. And I'm going to read them both. What plans are there to, are there to improve collaboration between apartments? to facilitate coming together as a university. And then in the same vein, another question. Despite good intentions and statements, university decision making does not seem collaborative from the staff perspective. How do you see changing that, or do you want to? OK, two um, really challenging questions. Um, the, the first, I mean, one of the things that has surprised me in coming back to Berkeley um, after being in a much, much simpler institution, is how complex and bureaucratic and decentralized the campus is in a way that I believe now carries huge costs for the university. It means people are never sure when a decision is made. It's never clear who's supposed to be making the decision. And it's, it seems as our culture, it's easy to, if you want to do something new, create a new department or a new unit or a new center to do it, rather than figure out how our current units or centers could change in order to accomplish whatever the goal is. So I believe that the collaboration issue is a symptom of a governance problem that we have, that we just need to learn how to become both more transparent and more agile in our governance. And I, I believe nobody has all the best ideas. I seek advice a lot and, um, and take advice, I hope, when it's um, often. But one of the things I've observed about this campus is um, people often represent as not being sufficiently consultative when, in fact, they're unhappy with the decision. And, and I think it's really important to be clear. Um, this is an enormously consensus-driven campus, but we may not be able to afford that kind of elaboration of consultation 
at a time when there are so many urgent issues pressing on us. I don't mean by that that I'm going to go up into you know, you know, my office in California Hall and just sit at my desk and decide a lot of things. Of course I, I, um, I consult. But you also have to have, I, I believe, healthy organizations have a respect for decision making. And sometimes I feel this campus has lost its respect for decision making. What do you mean by that? I mean, how do you, for, for the very act of making decisions, or people don't want to accept decisions they don't like? What, is, what does that mean exactly? Well, it, it, one of the you know, time honored ways of resisting a decision you don't like is say the process wasn't right. And um, so I, I think that it's, that it's the. Um, it's, you know, there are some very contentious issues that we're dealing with right now. I'll just name a few of them. Um, what to do with the Oxford Tract, whether to use it for housing. Um, what to do with People's Park, another one. And there are decisions about either of those, just to use those as um, examples, um, are, um, are not everyone is going to agree. What, about, what to do, I see Jenny Simon O'Neill here, what to do about the budget in athletics. Um, and um, what kind of size and scope of program can we afford? The answers to any of these questions, people are not all going to agree. But decisions really have to be made. What I've found in my career is best is you really explain how you're going to make a decision, what the timeline is for a decision, and then you stick to it. Uh, but I, I realize it's a, it, that's a that's an issue in any complex organization. This is probably one of the most complex organizations in terms of governance in existence. You have the office of the president. You've got the regents. You've got the legislature. You've got all the deans of all the colleges. You've got the ORU directors. You've got the administration. You've got the academic senate. And every one of those feels they have an ownership stake in every decision. And also every one of those doesn't particularly, isn't particularly comfortable with recognizing the ownership stake of others. So it's really, it's complicated. I think we can add that to your list of most challenging things. <laughs> yeah. um, so now I want to touch on something you brought up, and that was the issue of diversity. And this question goes as follows. Current data shows that underrepresented minority groups are significantly low in enrollment, and yet it is not and yet it is crucial, the, this person states, for excellence in the classroom. What can be done to ensure we have equitable representation of the public in California? Um, that they, I think we have to spend even more energy, effort, and money in, um, in uh, outreach, that is recruiting, um, for students to apply to Berkeley, and then outreach and yielding um, that uh, we have a very diverse state, but I think um, I, in coming back, it felt that the campus had been actually kind of shell-shocked by Proposition 209 and not, um, not tr tried to figure out as energetically as it might, you know, what kind of latitude do we have? And we have a lot of latitude in those two pieces of the recruitment process. I also believe that there is more opportunity in building a diverse transfer population than we currently um, have. That's where a lot of underrepresented students start at community colleges. I'm um, becoming a proponent of reinstituting, um, they're called TAG programs, programs in which you are admitted both to a community college and to a university campus at the same time. Um, then you have a very tight connection with that student in his or her years at the community college, and then they, you know, come come to Berkeley if they've you know taken the right classes and performed adequately in those classes. But I believe that the transfer, I think we have opportunities to diversify with transfer students that we haven't as fully taken advantage of as possible. Thanks. Um, so you had to bring up athletics. Now it's time to reap the rewards. <laughs> <laughs> Two questions on that front. Uh, one states, athletics is no longer responsible for the stadium debt, um, as per an announcement you issued earlier in the year. Is athletics receiving a higher budget cut or budget reduction as a result? And the similar question, what sort of budget cut will there be for athletics? And I think the broader question here is about 
the financial future of the program and where we are and what you anticipate? Well, first, let me talk about the stadium debt. First of all, it's not that the whole stadium debt is on the campus's books. It's the seismic portion of that debt, which is roughly 54% of that debt is on the campus's books. Um, I thought that that was important because um, I thought that we ha have an obligation as a campus to ensure the seismic safety of one of our um, biggest spaces for, um, for community, community events. Um, the, um, uh, I have said to athletics that their budget must be balanced by 2020, just as the campus's budget must be balanced by 2020. I actually do see a road to that. The uh, athletics is underperforming both in terms of revenue generation and in terms of philanthropy. So there are lots of opportunities there. Doesn't mean that there may not be some really hard decisions um, that uh, as, we, as we reach the balanced budget. Athletics has shared the budget size budget reductions of all the administrative units on campus. I've tried to protect the academic units, but they've had significant budget reductions. And, um, and uh, but one of the things, we recently had a study of athletics um, by a, a firm called Collegiate Sports Associates, CSA. One of the things I discovered as a result of that study, which is kind of stunning to me, is that the um, uh, monies that athletics gives the campus, if setting aside the deficit, which is a huge setting aside, I admit that, but the monies that come to the campus are greater than the contribution that the campus makes to athletics. There is a Byzantine um, financial, um, I can't, it's hard to call it a plan, system. Mess. Uh, um, that, um, that is, you know, it's, it, it's a lot of our finances on campus are Byzantine and not transparent, but athletics, they're particularly so. And I think we just have to have greater transparency. But I, I don't think, and the CSA confirmed this, it's not that there's waste, fraud, and abuse. Um, it's really that with the campus has never come to terms, in my view, with the um, tension between our goals in athletics and, and the resources available to athletics. Okay, we're going to shift gears here a little bit for a question about unions and representation, and the, the, the twofold question. Do you think having collective representation for staff categories is an aid or a hindrance to achieving your goals? How so? And the second part is, what would your top advice be to staff considering the unionization drives? Is that supporting the mission? I believe in unions. I, I think that um, uh, union representation has been good for the American workforce. I had lots of unions at Smith. We worked very, very constructively together. And, um, and I think that this campus, from my observation, has a somewhat, um, I don't want to say needlessly antagonistic, but more antagonistic than, than you know, would be I ideal. And it's the relationship between the campus and the unions. And so what would your advice be for that second part of the question for, for staff who are facing unionization drives and trying to understand how best I, to respond? I, 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 I think that this is really a personal conscience and work, workplace conscience, if you can use that word, issue for staff themselves. I wouldn't give any advice pro or con. Um, moving on to the third rail of former third rail of Berkeley politics. Um, regarding plans to develop People's okay. Park, what kind of opposition do you anticipate? There's a positive question. What kind of opposition do you anticipate, and how do you plan to respond to that opposition? Uh, People's Park, I mean, whatever you think of the ideals that um, motivated the creation of the park in the 1960s, I don't think anybody walking past or in the park today could say it represents those ideals. Um, I've been very troubled by the crime in the park. Um, one of our staff members who works in the park, really serving the park, was violently attacked um, maybe two weeks ago. Um, a two-year-old playing in the park was fed methamphetamine and taken to the hospital. I mean, it's really horrible. And, um, and I think it's our land, and we have a responsibility for it. I. I 
believe the situation of homelessness is one of the greatest public challenges in our country today. Um, I, it used to be that people who um, traveled to India would say how hard it was to see the very close juxtaposition of wealth and poverty in India. Our country has become the same way. And I believe we have to be a partner with the city in addressing the issue of homelessness. So the solution that I'm gonna propose in just a few weeks publicly, but you can hear this now, here, <laughs> is to propose that we build about 50 beds of long-term housing for the homeless on People's Park with you know, wraparound services so, so, um, so that um, those students, uh, the um, uh, population gets the kind of help it needs. Um, part of it as a park, and a, a usable park, as opposed to the park now, which is not terribly usable. And then student housing, which is so desperate a need. And so I hope this three-way um, uh, plan, this tripartite plan, will gain acceptance. Um, I've been talking about it a lot informally and have not um, gotten a lot of resistance to it. The mayor has said he would be happy when I announce this plan to be my partner in announcing it. Um, the mayor supports it, as does the city council. So, I mean, maybe this is fool's rush in, where angels fear to, fear to tread, but I feel we have a kind of opening now where we could do something with the park that would both recognize and contribute to the solution of the problem of homelessness, but also provide much, much needed um, f housing for our students. There was also another related question that came in from the audience um, regarding homelessness and specifically, so I think as many people know, you're not living in University House. Um, you had a home in Berkeley where you happily returned to and the University House is obviously continues to be used for campus events and government and community relations is being moved in. Uh, and to occupy some of that space. Regardless, the question was how you reacted to the demand of some students that the university house be converted into some sort of residence hall for some number of them. Um, I don't think that was a, um, um, a very realistic proposal. At the same time, I very much respect the advocacy of these students in regard to student homelessness. As I've said, I think it's a huge problem. I don't think turning University House into um, uh, uh, um, housing for homeless students is, is the right answer. It's not finally a long-term or a structural answer. Our problem is really that we have so few beds um, I, we have just a few more than 7,000 beds. I can't remember the number of hundreds with the 7,000 for 40,000 students. And uh, a, a community in which housing is extraordinarily expensive and also really hard to find. So that what we need to do is, I, I've said, double the, our housing capacity. We're doing this in the first instance by long-term leases and then we're going to be building on all the land we can build on, and that will include People's Park, and it will include the Oxford Tract. Um, that, that, that seems to me so fundamental to the quality of student experience to better address their needs for, um, for affordable housing and, and, and also for food. So we're gonna move into a couple of questions here in the budget realm. Um, the first one is, so what are you doing to either confront or combat or plan for ever what the, uh, the questioner uh, describes as ever dis decreasing state support? And how is that transforming the campus's financial model? Well, I hope that we can keep our state support. Um, I am not optimistic that we'll be able to increase it, but I've been spending a lot of time in Sacramento this spring talking to legislators, and the tenor of the conversations is changing. And they are more, and I've been experiencing much more openness to buying out the tuition increase and to restoring the 1% that Jerry Brown cut from the um, agree, previously agreed upon 4% increase to our state allocation. I think we have to be present and actively engaged in Sacramento. So 
that the only face in Sacramento is not the face of the office of the president, but that they see the campuses and understand the faculty and the students are the, 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 the really the, the, the people that the inadequate budget really hurts. Um, so I believe that we have to be constantly vigilant about, um, about uh, the state. Um, it was Chris Treadway who said, we should be treating our legislators like donors. And I believe that that's a very um, good way of putting it. And it really changes your way of understanding that, those meetings. Um, that um, I, I also believe that the, uh, we absolutely must multiply and diversify sources of revenue. That there is um, uh, nobody is going to come in on a white horse with you know saddlebags full of gold and save us. We really have to look to our uh, our own creativity and ingenuity. Of course, always do things that are consistent with our mission and our objectives, our character as a public institution. But we have lots of levers we can we can um, pull, and we should be doing that. So just to follow up on that, I think for a lot of us it seems like a slam dunk and we struggle to understand why legislators would resist any sort of return to the level of funding the university used to enjoy given the return on investment and the clear public service and the growing population of prospective students. What do you hear up there when they, what, what's the argument for the status quo and for not some sort of return to funding that's more appropriately matched with what the needs are of the state and of the population we serve? Well, I hear three things, um, uh, uh, only one of which I, I, I mean, I certainly grew credibility that people think all three things, but I think only one of them is, a, is, is really a substantive answer. The one that's a substantive answer is um, the, the tax structure of the state and the entitlements, there simply isn't any money even if the legislators were very differently minded. I think the best opportunity for increased funding for the university is a proposition that's gonna be on the ballot in 2020, the next um, uh, uh, presidential election, that will um, remove corporations um, from the protections of Proposition 13. This would create hu huge income streams for the, for the campus. And so we have to be really um, work very hard. There are powerful interests already organizing against this. Obviously, corporations are not very happy about this. And, um, and also be really uh, very deliberate about lobbying for that money to go to education um, if, if the proposition passes. So um, that I see the root problem is not a we don't like you problem, but a, but, a, but a revenue problem in the structure of the state's finances. The two things that I hear are, um, they're very, they're, a lot of legislators are very unhappy at various things that they um, put at the door of the office of the president, and, um, and they think we waste money and we're paid too much. There you go. Um, the next question has to do with the humanities and its intersection with budgetary issues. And that how do you see support of the, or and I guess the potential for additional support of humanities in this climate, a climate where there's a lot of money uh, for private investment in technology and for business and for science. So, uh, how does that humanity? I think one of the most important budget questions that we have to answer is um, what a reasonable tax rate is right now. Every ag agreement that we have on campus is its own agreement, and there are you know, dozens, if not hundreds, of different tax rates on different things. What we have to do is say, for those who have the uh, you know, possibility of, um, of uh, engaging in revenue-producing um, kinds of programs and activities, we have to figure out how that best serves the rest of the campus. And this is a question, actually, not just about humanities. There are public good, common good kinds of units like the library. The library can't go out and raise money. 
But so you have to figure out what a, what a reasonable tax rate is. So you don't have a system where the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And you don't have a system in which various units that have lots of revenue producing um, opportunities, like the Haas School, for example, or the law school, um, are not contributing to what are the kind of common goods services. So these are complicated financial issues. That's why I said the hardest issues to me in this job are trying to figure out those financial issues where we're moving to a really different financial model. And it's complicated intellectually to do that. Thank you. Um, so this one is about, has to do with graduate, graduate admissions. Uh, sorry, the writing is a little hard to read. Graduate admissions, um, particularly in the arts, humanities, and social sciences, um, but not exclusively, do not appear to consider the realities of potential employment for those students. Does the university's business model, which relies heavily upon inexpensive graduate student labor, not create a perverse incentive for Berkeley in particular? Well, I think it's unconscionable to grow graduate programs to meet undergraduate teaching needs. I think that graduate programs should be sized in ways that are appropriate for the market. I also don't think, though that I'm a kind of um, odd person out in this view, that it's not a great thing to get a PhD in English or history if you want a career in something else. Um, I, I, I believe we're moving in the right direction and that um, departments' um, uh, desires um, to have their students well supported is leading them voluntarily to shrink their PhD programs, and I think that's a, that's a good thing. We will have to think differently about our undergraduate teaching needs, but that's the right thing to do. Good. And, one, um, and then this one, um, our ORUs are facing up to a 20% budget cut. How is this equitable in comparison to other areas receiving cuts? I, d I actually think that question is inaccurate. I've just met with, um, with uh, um, Randy Katz uh, I, two days ago, like last week. I can't remember when it was. And he has them working on a budget planning exercise. First of all, the 20% the exercise is on the state portion of the budget. That's very different from the whole budget. And it's an exercise. It's not what the, what the cuts are. The cuts are much, much smaller. So we're just about out of time, and I just had, I had one last question. Carol, you're one of the straightest shooters that I know. <laughs> and um, in that context, you know, you've, you've put a stake in the ground around a balanced budget in 2020, and I'm, how confident are you? And how do you feel about the longer range future of the university right now, given all these challenges that we've been talking about? Um, when you go home at night, when you think about the road ahead, how are you feeling? Well, I am completely confident that we're going to balance our budget by 2020. That's not, I, I, I see the path there, we're going to get there. And it would be terrible for the campus to, um, to just feel like you're in this endless tunnel of despair of not having a balanced budget. What's much harder is making that budget stick in the, in the out years. So I'm not at all concerned that we won't make a balanced budget by 2020. But creating the financial model that is robust enough to sustain an institution at this excellence is going to take a lot of very imaginative um, work on the campus's part. It's going to take disciplined decision making in which we will choose the um, things that are the most important bets and say no to some nice shiny objects that um, are probably not going to lead us that far. And, um, and requires a lot of operational discipline, which we, hasn't always been our strong suit. And longer term, the future of the university? I, 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 this is, the University of California is the greatest public university in the world. And I feel for all of us, we're its custodians. And I, it has such, it is hard to take a university that's not very good and make it great. It's really hard. We have a university that's great. And so it's on us, all of us, to um, make the choices that um, sustain that greatness. So I, I believe in the people here. And ultimately, this is really about the people here, the faculty, the staff, the students, and our wonderful alumni. 
Well, I can't think of any better note to end this, uh, what was a really fantastic conversation. And I just thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.